In August, the top story on Facebook and Pinterest about food was about popsicles that can get you drunk. The second story was a lie about Burger King and their burgers being filled with horse meat. Sadly, this is not at all uncommon. Even with its continuing adjustments, fake news and made-up content dominate Facebook and other social networks. The spread of viral content fraud, fake news, and popular fabrications have impacted our ability to trust news. It may have changed the course of the American election, perhaps other countries as well. Yet fake news and content fraud represent a vast network fed by thousands of sites, amplified by hundreds of thousands of social media accounts, and tailored in a way to influence users who, through ad tech, are specifically targeted for their vulnerability for such lies. Mainstream tech companies have become the vectors of a long-term con job, diluting the public for the benefit of a particular political belief or just plain profit. And the biggest of those tech, money, uh, tech companies are making a lot of money by doing so. But news media is not. The spread and amplification of misinformation has created an existential threat across democracies. The European Union's General Data Protection and Regulation Act, or GDPR, represents a major effort by governments to combat this flow of misinformation on behalf of their citizens. No one knows if it'll work, but it seems like the first step in an international attempt to regulate companies that use people's data to feed them lies, and it should, will soon be followed by a major Californian privacy law. Both could enact huge fines against companies that fail to give readers control of their information. It seems like no matter what gets into place, content fraud is spiraling ever further out of our control, a confusing mess from which there seems to be no escape. Hi, I'm Aram Zuckersharf, and now that we're settled in, I'll take a minute to introduce myself. I'm the director of ad tech engineering at the Washington Post, and I work with teams across the organization to help the Post figure out new ways to make money. Um, I also work with our ARC platform, which is given and sold to other publications, and there too I help them make money in new and interesting ways. I've had a long road to this point. I've been a journalist. Uh, I was briefly a terrible salesman. I was a freelance strategy consultant. I've been a developer and a full stack developer and worked at a number of different media companies. The advantage of this weird ARC is I have my, a unique perspective, and that's what I'm here to share with you today. If you have any questions, there'll be good moments to pause and hash stuff out. It would also be great if you could tweet at me using the hashtag BrokenAdTech. Um, my Twitter account is also there. I'll be watching the tweets. And throughout the uh, evening, you'll see this prompt up on the top, which will allow you to use your laptop to go and send me a question directly to this podium here. And this is the second of these workshops. The first of these workshops is archived at this URL. I'll have this presentation and the archive video of this workshop going out at the end. Um, in the previous workshop, we talked about how advertisers and publishers race for attention, how banner blindness is a design pattern that causes people to ignore display ads when they show up on their web page. We talked about how user targeting impacts you and impacts what ads you see. And we talked about how very little of this has been planned. And because of it, it's had a number of unintended and pretty bad consequences. Today, we'll be going over the underlying data structure of how websites are built on the internet. And we'll talk about how tech companies use these structures to make money and how that affects and deforms journalism websites. And we'll be talking about how we can build new structures with our ethics as media organizations, as mad journalists, or as people who are interested in a better internet in mind. But before we get to all that, let's step back. Um, back when the internet was young, the World Wide Web was mostly connected manually. Portal sites like Yahoo, or that menu that popped up when you dialed into AOL, could suggest a variety of links to websites that human editors thought would be relevant for people looking to specific topics. In addition, sites would link to each other, sometimes in purposeful formats like web rings, a system where sites would choose to line themselves up in an order and prompt the user to rotate through those sites related by topic. Though the web was run on machines, the main thing to remember is that it was connecting to other parts of it was a purely human affair. 
We'd look through topics, find sites that got us interested, and get recommendations from humans on other sites to find more parts of the web to explore. As the web got larger, it wasn't really possible for humans to manually link all of the parts to it to each other. Um, and to sort of give you an example of that, I have this wonderful link here. This will take you to the web archive of Yahoo 1997. Um, what I'd like you to do as an experiment is try and find uh, a link to a website called The Motley Fool, which was a financial advice site at the time, um, from the Yahoo homepage, just clicking through links. Let's see how fast we can get it done. And we have this nice countdown here. You got five minutes. Um, the URL is uh, aaronzs.me. Sorry, uh, let's reset that. Slash HNP. Oop. All right, so let's restart the time. That's aaronzs.me slash HNP. Um, if you have a phone, you will find that this design is very unfortunate for phones. Um, but give it a try, and we'll see how long it takes. Um, once you've found the Motley Fool on the site, just raise your hand. Sure, it is A-R-A-M-Z-S dot M-E slash H-N-P. And as you're looking through this, keep in mind, archive.org, which is the location of the Internet Archive, a repository of place, the history of the web, is a great resource. I highly recommend diving into it. They have websites archived. They have all sorts of other stuff archived. Um, if you ever have the opportunity to go to their headquarters in California, it's in a church. It's very cool. I highly recommend it. And once you've found it, just raise your hand. Okay, we've got one person who found it. Because I went back and forth and this restarted, we'll end a minute before the end. Um, so you got two minutes. You found it, awesome, we got two people. All right, one minute left. Is anyone still looking? Still looking? Okay. You found it? It took you 10 seconds. All right. Oh, the search works. Well, sort of, sort of uh, hoping you'd click through things, but search working is a surprise. I did not, last time I tested this, it did not work. Okay, well, I think the majority of us has found everything, uh, have found it by now. And so let's move forward. You may have noticed that if you did use links, it was pretty difficult to hunt it down through all of those links. And so this is why the web entered and started blossoming with search providers. Um, we moved from that first Yahoo page, which is more like a library index, to Google, 
which scrapes the entire web up, scans every page, and tries to sort and show them to you based on what you typed into a search bar. This is not an easy process. This barge is 250 feet long, 72 feet wide, and 16 feet deep. It's filled with dozens of shipping containers. Um, we believe it's likely a Google floating data center, perhaps not the only one. If their floor plans line up with the previously released Google data, each shipping container on that boat holds 1,160 servers each. This is one data center, and I don't know exactly how many data centers Google has or at what size, but you can be sure that hundreds of thousands of computer servers are just a drop in the bucket compared to the total number of devices needed to store, scrape, and understand the internet on a daily basis. So, Searching the web is not just difficult, it's also expensive. And if anyone finds a way to make searching on the web even just a little bit easier, a little less intense in the use of Google servers, it's going to make a company like Google millions of dollars. So the way, first way that they looked at to save themselves some money on searching the web was to find out information about the information, that being metadata, information about what the page they were scanning was. Structured data is information about what content is typed onto a particular web page. And site level data tells them about the entire domain. When it comes to metadata, it forms the most important parts of how your site shows up in a search result, like this. Now, this is that data in the form of HTML. You can see a title tag, an author tag, and a keywords tag, as well as a description tag. Now, the author keyword tag is here, but it's not standard. Um, that's one that some search engines use, some social media sites use, and some do not. Um, they had an experiment around with it, but it didn't work out so well. There is no way built into HTML to mark authorship. We'll go into some alternatives later. But that's what the basic metadata that describes your website looks like. This is what a site map looks like. It has a bunch of information about all of the pages that are within your site. What is in those pages, what types of pages they are, what objects are involved. It can have information designating how frequently they're updated or what topics they're on. This lets Google create a very fast summary of what is on your site. But also, how your site links. So what it's linking to, what information it's linking to. This is one of the reasons why Drudge became such a success early on in the, in the internet. And before you ask, yes, the Drudge Report is still an enormously successful website. This type of information became the foundation of an algorithm called PageRank, which is what Google uses to sort the web and get assigned pages, domains, URLs, individual values. The, this data is part of it. There are other factors as well. Um, if anyone here has, for example, access to their .edu uh, website, because it's provided to you through your university, um, you should leverage on it, because having a .edu domain is extra points to your page rank, just as an example of one of the other factors. Um, what this does is allows them to understand what should be at the top of that search page. With these elements, the first generation of search engine optimization was born. SEO tends to be a dirty word in journalism, but doing it properly is a good thing. Not just because it makes your work easier to find by Google, but also because it makes it easier for you to structure a website in a way that readers can find what is on that site. So. To sort of take a look at how this all works, I've built us a little exercise. If you go ahead to that URL, you will find yourself at the classic SEO simulator. And I'm going to, uh, yes, slash COS. And so what is going on on this page? Sorry. 
My internet went down for a second. So this is the classic SEO simulator. How you use it is you are going to build a title and description for your site and you're going to try and use keywords. When Google looks at the title and description to try and figure out what is going on on your website, what's important about it, it looks and tries to find particular key terms. In this case, you're going to be doing a little bit of the work. You're going to be trying to decide what is a key term on your site. So what you can do here is type in your title, and this is the title for your personal site. And if you think a word is important, you can use a hashtag to indicate that it's a keyword. <laughs> so if you submit this, it's going to take a look at what your overall score is. It's going to show you what that HTML would look like. And what this score is, is your Google Trends. So what's happening is we are checking the Google Trend API, which tells us how popular a search term is, in this case, in the last year and in the United States. And it's going to rate your keyword as to its popularity, that being how many people are searching for it. Now, when you're doing this type of search engine optimization, there's a balance. If your information, if your keyword is too popular, you're going to have too much competition. So if your keyword rating goes above 50, then we invert it. So in this case, it's going to be my keyword score for stuff is going to be 100 minus 64. Um, and if it's under 50, then you're sort of competing in a space where you might actually make it to the top of the page, of that search page. So once you've typed it up, keeping in mind, this is maximum 60 characters. This is the title value, and this is maximum 160 characters. That's the description value. You're going to try and figure out what keywords work best. The system will add them together when you search. And once you've gotten the highest score you can get for a description of yourself, you can tweet out your score to the hashtag and tell us all how well you optimized. Um, this is a simulator of sort of the classic way of doing search engine optimization. We'll go into some of the other factors that matter later on in this presentation. But it's a good way to just sort of get a sense of what keywords are, what they are relevant to you. So why don't you give it a try and uh, tweet them out as you get it in. I'll give you about five, ten minutes to try and get the highest score. Um, like I said, you can scroll down and see what different keyword values are. Your total score is here. And you just have to hit that submit button. And it, when you are hashtagging your key terms, if it has a space in it, you put a, a hyphen, like we have here. So here are my tips. You can go to Google Trends by Googling Google Trends um, and test out some keywords for yourself before you get started. So give it a try and tell me what your high scores are. And please ask questions if you have any questions. Are you trying to get a low score or a high score? Your goal is to get the highest score possible. It's the scale. Just goes up. Just goes up. Just keep going up. Yep. This is classic SEO work, so Google hasn't put in all those protections against keyword stuffing yet.
And remember, you can keep hitting that submit button every time you modify it. Once you get to the end of your character count, it won't let you type anymore. The second item mode is using the comma or just space? Um, for hashtags or just for yeah, separate? Yeah, that's okay. Just a space. Unless it's one word, in which case you use a dash to connect it under the hashtag. Right, so. This is how you do a multi word key value, key term. This is how you do a single word stuff. And I might do something like this. Sadly, my name does not trend nearly as high as Donald Trump's. This is zero. I'm not trending on Google. And when you're done and uh, you've tweeted it out, got about five more minutes, don't close that page. You'll be using that information that a little bit later. Or if you don't mind rebuilding it, that's fine. We can close the page. <laughs> Also, if you don't feel comfortable tweeting it out, you can send it to me via the link, and we can compare our scores. Or, uh, yeah. I do not. Um, there is a guest uh, Wi-Fi new school dash guest, and it will. If you go through there, it'll pop up a window. You give them your email, and they'll email you a link to log you in. Yeah, the problem is well. I got a score once, and then I forgot to do it. I hope Google Trends API is not 
Looks like Google Trends is not happy we are hitting it quite so often. <laughs> oh, silver lining is it is it is too successful. Wait a uh, wait a minute and then resubmit. I think is the best thing to do. Um, I'll take a look to see if there's a good way I can modify it. Well, uh, if you could tweet out your score and you were able to, thank you. If not, live demos. I apologize. Google Trends is apparently overloaded with the number of things that we are sending. Not because it's overloaded, just because it doesn't like us sending a lot of requests. But I encourage you to go back and try it out later. Um, and I'll see about maybe batching the requests in a different way. OK. Well, uh, I saw some people got some decent scores up on there. Awesome. And I'm sorry if the scoring did not work for you. We will continue, though, and try it again later. All right, so as these classic SEO strategies started to roll out to more and more of the web, we saw some publications launching up around aggregation, basically collecting links to other sites, writing summaries, posting them up. Huffington Post was one example. They did their own original content, but a lot of aggregation as well. And by becoming these sort of nodes of a lot of information about the web, they were able to rank very high with the stuff that they posted. Um, unfortunately, plenty of people did this in perhaps less legitimate ways. So there was some additional definition added to how page rank was calculated. Four different types of links were defined when your site gets crawled by Google. Internal links, Google is looking for how you link to pages inside your own site. And this is true of pretty much all search engines in one way or another, just we're all using Google, let's be honest. Um, outbound links are links that you place to some other site outside of your domain. Inbound links are people who are linking to you. And reciprocal links are when you link to someone else and they link back to the same page. So this was an attempt to balance out some of the effects that aggregators and people who were collecting a lot of data were having. Um, the other thing that happened was these links got weighted. So if a particularly highly page ranked site would link to your site, that link would matter more in the search algorithm's calculation of your prominence than if some nothing site that appeared on the web yesterday linked to it. Unfortunately, people started figuring out ways to game this system pretty fast as well. Um, the Link Exchange was a company in which you would put your link onto the exchange and it would show up on a whole variety of other sites and those other sites would all automatically be linking back to you. This was perhaps one of the 
more legitimate of the gaming systems. Some of the other systems were a lot more aggressive and far less legit in how they operated. Um, fun fact, the guy who ran that link exchange advertised there is now the CEO of Zappos. So it worked out all right for him. As Google rose in prominence and its single way of doing things and reading out and ranking the internet, people became more centered on different points of vulnerability in that system and how to game them. This is an example of a uh, private network of sites. How this works is one person launches a whole bunch of sites, fills them with random content, and then has them link back to the site that actually makes money. Um, there are still lots of those out there. Um, this is still a tactic that garners some success. Another tactic, if you've ever run your own website with a commenting section, you've noticed all those comments that have all sorts of weird links in them. The reason that's there is they're linking back to their site and they're hoping you'll accidentally publish this comment and the value that your site has will be lent as a degree of authenticity to their domain and how it ranks on Google search. Now, Google had to make defrauding the page rank system harder. It also had to push for ways the search process could become more effective, saving that money. So they began to promote and build on a much earlier concept that had long lain dormant. And they forced sites to make it part of their equation, the semantic web. In 2001, Tim Berners-Lee, best known as the inventor of the World Wide Web, with co-authors in Scientific American, laid out the semantic web as not just a way to bring more data about pages to the systems that might parse them, so that would be things like Google search or things like an Amazon Echo. The data that comes out of there when you ask a question and it searches the internet comes out of semantic structures. The idea was that the semantic web would also create structured data about what was on a page by informing how those web pages were coded. Literally, the structure of the HTML. The problem was that when people started building the web, there wasn't a clear purpose to how the words and designs and various HTML tags were laid out. So structured semantic data brought forth a promise that the form and function of the page would describe itself um, as you built out that HTML on the page. A early example of this, one that's still in use today, is the H card. It is perhaps one of the early popular semantic markups for HTML to gain a foothold. It's known as a microformat, and it's used by systems, including Google, to understand data about blocks of HTML on the page. Normally, if you put your name on a page, Google has no way to understand. It's a name, it doesn't understand it's your name, it doesn't understand what its relationship to the page is, it doesn't understand what it matters about or when it was updated or any of these things. By adding code to your divs on your web page, you're able to tell search engines and other tools that crawl these pages what is going on inside your HTML. This example here is a name H card. And what it's doing is it's saying what this person, who this person is, that they're a person, what the configuration of their name is, and a whole bunch of other metadata about this person. Link markup is also pretty standardized at this what point. This person, who this person is, that they're a person, what the configuration of their name is. That is me talking to you again. <laughs> Um, that's the live stream, so we know it's working. Um, okay, link markup is also very standard. There is a standard link called follow or no follow. A lot of sites will advise you to do one or the other, but it has a purpose. When you mark a link as a relationship, that's what RHEL stands for, follow, what it says is that you are lending your authority as whatever rank your page is to that page. It's important and you want to be related to it. You are following it. If you rank it no follow, you're saying, don't pay attention to this when you crawl my page. This is not a URL that matters relative to my page. Also, the title value. That's what you see when you mouse over a link and there's a bunch of text. If you've ever used a screen reader, um, which sometimes has to be done if you're testing for blind people to use your page, you see that information as well. This provides a bunch of words that Google can associate with that URL, allowing you to know, allowing Google to understand 
how you would describe that page, further ranking its value. Now, these two semantic markups, the H card and the rel value for links, became very widely adopted. Dozens of other standards were added to this process, supported by some sites and not by others. Every time someone wrote up a formalized approach to how semantic code should work on someone's web page, and they got people to use it, it would be a standard, a methodology that multiple people can and did adopt to use their creation uh, for their creation of HTML websites. But the problem was everyone had their own idea for how the semantic internet should work and what those standards should be and how the page should get marked up. If the whole point was saving time and money, then too many standards are just as big a problem as none. But Google wasn't the only person or organization searching for an easier way to scan the web. In 2010, Facebook announced its own semantic standard called Open Graph. Now, Open Graph was a way to describe the web as objects with defined properties and relationships. The Open Graph standard was very quickly adopted by social networks all over the web. Um, by the way, though Google Plus supported at the time, between starting this presentation and finishing it, Google Plus stopped supporting anything because it's gone. That's the internet for you. This is what open graph tags look like. The first set are pretty much the same as those initial meta tags you saw um, with our initial SEO optimization. You still have the name of the page, the description of it, some information about it. Um, main difference here is you can associate a primary image with it. That's the image you see when you share a link on Facebook. And you can assign a location. In this case, I'm saying I am an English speaker in the United States. But Open Graph has more information than that. It allows you to categorize your content. You can see there's tags here, information about who published it, what the primary category is, and information about what type of page this is. There are a number of primary types of pages that Facebook defined and that people use to relate themselves to Facebook pages and Facebook users. These are the four most popular ones. Music, video, article, and profile. I'll be sharing the link to this, uh, this presentation at the end, and you can explore using this link, ogp.me, all of the different things that Facebook and the Open Graph Coalition, which became more than Facebook, defined as objects on the page. I think that the best way to sort of dig into this is to take a look at what Open Graph actually looks like. Um, on a real life page. So if you go to this URL, aramzs.me slash OGD, you will find Facebook's own Open Graph Debugger. This is a public tool that you can use to see what the Open Graph data is on a page. So um, I'd like you to go ahead and take a look at it yourself, but I am also going to go over there and for those folks who maybe don't have access to it because their laptop or their phone or whatever, why don't you uh, pick a publisher, um, not the Washington Post, because I can't talk about there because I work there, um, but some other publisher, and we'll go to their site, we'll pull an article and see what their open graph tags look like. So someone shout out a publication. BuzzFeed News. BuzzFeed News. <coughs> Okay, lucky me, I, for some reason, have a random BuzzFeed News article in my browser here. Sure. Um, I think I was just looking, actually, at the markup of this thing before. So we're going to take the URL for that page, and we're going to click debug on it. So this will sometimes happen. Nobody has ever sh shared this particular BuzzFeed news link to Facebook. There's not many people interested in Secret Service folks. Um, so I'm going to fetch it. This is the first time it's been fetched. This is sort of an interesting thing to note. It's people who share their links onto Facebook, if you are producing stuff on the web, you will occasionally find that it has stored an old version. That's because Google 
searches for it, scrapes it the first time someone shares it, and caches that. So you can actually use this tool also to force that cache to be renewed. So that will correct problems with sharing. And we're going to take a quick look at what is going on here. And you can follow along if you've opened up your own version of this on your laptop. So what it's showing is the time it's scraped. This is what URL it got. This is the canonical URL. A canonical URL should be on every web page. And basically what it's saying is, this is the origin of this piece of content. And if anybody out there on the World Wide Web has duplicated it, they are not the source of that content. We can see a preview of how this share looks. There's that open graph image and the open graph title. And when you scroll down, we can see a whole bunch of open graph properties that have been associated with this particular page. So we can see that this page has been associated with a Facebook application, with this particular URL. The type is article. This is what the title is. Here's the image. Um, and you can sometimes see some fun stuff in how websites handle images here. In this case, we now can see that BuzzFeed News crops its image based on some parameters in the URL. The description of the link that gets shown when you share it. The site name. When this article was last updated. The ID of the author, in this case, the author on BuzzFeed News is attached to a Facebook ID, so the author has their own Facebook page. The publisher has their own Facebook page. We can see what section BuzzFeed News has decided to put it in. We can see a bunch of tags. It looks like uh, something may have gone a little wrong here for BuzzFeed News, but most of it is working. This is the terms that they consider to be important. And there's a bunch of other data here as well. Now, I highly recommend as you go through the web and you share things and you see how they show up on your page, try checking out some of those links here. Um, the best way to learn about this stuff is to see how it's enacted in the wild. Did anyone see anything when they looked at this on their own machine that they had any questions about? Oh, that's not where my mouse is. Do you happen to know what the IAM space is at the bottom of Yes, so at the bottom of this, there's an IA namespace here. Yep, um, this IA stands for Instant Articles. That's Facebook Instant Articles, which is you can push your articles to Facebook to have Facebook cache them internally, and then people, when they open them on their, bra on their phone, don't leave the Facebook app, don't go to a different URL. Um, in this case, BuzzFeed News has chosen not to make this article available on Instant Articles. Um, they are not the only ones. For the most part, publishers have been leaving Facebook Instant Articles because they don't make a lot of money because it's not a page under their control. Any other questions? Yes? So if, if there's not those properties on a page, what does that mean? That means that there are no open graph tags on that page, and they should be added um, to make it easier to share on social. Now, when you share on social, if there are no open graph tags, it will try and pull those default search engine tags, your title and your description. It'll find the first image on the page and put that in there. But very often, that's not what you want. And also, maybe that's not what you want shared in the specific social setting, which is why open graph tags can be very important. I'll move this back down. And that is a publicly accessible tool. Anyone can use it anytime they'd like. And there we go. OK. So what has happened over time? Facebook has started taking on the majority of publisher traffic. Now. This would change as we can become closer to today. But for many years, um, up until basically a couple weeks ago, Facebook was the primary source of traffic by a pretty large margin. And eventually, 
get becoming more prominent as a source of traffic than even Google for most publishers. Um, you can see how these all come out, and you can see it separating at the very top there. But the thing is, it isn't just pages on the web that get structured. The data goes there, it's in that head area for your web page, but Facebook is mapping those, that data, mapping it into their system, and they're mapping against users. So one open graph website description, remember that publisher ID is associated with a Facebook page, and so therefore the information about that publisher URL and all of the data that Google, Facebook collects on it is now mapped against that profile page. So Facebook has optimized to have those Facebook profile pages for your organization, for your website, for you personally, representing a single thing. It might be a publisher, it might be a passion, it might be a topic, it might be an idea. And those single things then get mapped to you as a user. But the problem is Facebook is taking the lead on this. Publishers never took the lead on Open Graph. And as a result, there's a lot of things that you can be passionate about on Facebook, topics you can be interested in, but publishing sites don't rank high among them. Ideas do, uh, hobbies do, but when Facebook is tying those user interests to particular sources of content, they're tying them based on things that have nothing to do with what that publication is or who works for it. They're looking at those topics, that category, keywords, that type of information, to figure out whether or not this page is likely to grab you as a member of a larger audience. That meant publications had two approaches if they wanted to succeed on Facebook. They had to either focus really strongly on a particular topic or very strongly on a particular audience. Some did both, but this was a major way that Facebook differentiated itself to its users and in terms of the ads that it sold. Google is interested in how sites link to each other and how they link out, but Facebook is interested in how users link to your site. And the best way it knows how to measure that is when your site has a corresponding Facebook page. Now, the Facebook algorithm has changed a lot in eight years of Open Graph being around, all that data being fed in. But it still mostly understands its success in reaching particular audiences or particular topics, and often as a percentage of the total posts on a Facebook page. So it's looking at how many of the posts on a particular page are successful in reaching a particular audience or a particular topic. Advertisers have greater targeting available on Facebook, and as a result, Ad tech companies serving publishers are chasing the same type of focus. This pushed publications themselves being deformed by this, these priorities from Facebook first and then these ad tech providers second to become more and more focused, particularly on topics, but also in other ways. Now, a, a number of particularly user type uh, focused companies were funded by venture capital or internal innovation units um, in the last decade. They're usually on a particular stated goal when these uh, publications are funded and founded. They became about serving millennials. And what that really means is serving millennials on Facebook. So venture capital, people who fund these companies to start up, they hadn't been particularly interested in funding news organizations before this decade. So, why is so much money flowing into these individual startups and companies? Well, as those publications grew on the web and more traditional publications grew on the web, they became uh, more locked into the economics of having these very focused audiences on Facebook. Highly engaged pages tied to particular URLs. And what would happen is their verticals, the topics that they cover, became unbundled. These are just a few examples here, but it happened all over the web. Basically, various topics and verticals that were particularly successful, especially with that audience that they are chasing, um, became their own URLs, because that one URL could be attached to one Facebook page with a, with a much higher success rate than their main page. Um, this was especially a strategy designed around the requirements that are coming down from Facebook. Once they had optimized for this topical audience, they could really lean into that 
demographic audience that they were targeting, those particular types of users, trying to match Facebook by capture, capturing those very specific audiences. Because in the world of advertising technology, the more specific the audience you can deliver to your advertiser, the more you can charge. Now the thing about VC is venture capital chases big plays. That means they're not really interested in investing in you unless they think you can double their money or better. And when you're building a product that primarily monetizes, makes money through people arriving and reading that content, that means what you're really promising is that you are going to get a lot of people visiting your site very quickly. Now, there's a reason why, if you've been paying, seeing it in media news, a lot of these media companies are trying to become tech companies. Because in tech companies, investors bet on what the future is, not the present. And the ad tech model allows these companies to track and value their users without ever launching advertisements. Now, why would that matter so much? The answer is that when you're working at a startup, you're not making money by selling ads. Um, if you watched the film The Social Network, you'll remember that at the very beginning, Mark Zuckerberg talks about how he doesn't want to put ads on the site because that would ruin it. Now, was Mark Zuckerberg never going to put ads on Facebook? Obviously not. So what was going to be ruined exactly? The answer is his ability to get money by getting users. See, this concept of investor story time is you're going to go to your investor, your venture capital for your journalism startup, and you're not going to tell them, I'm going to put a bunch of ads on my site and then people will get upset because they don't like ads and it'll turn out that nobody even looks at ads and that's how we're going to make our money. No, you're going to say, we're waiting to put ads on our website. One day those ads will come, but look at all of these amazing, very focused, millennial, topical users we have right this minute. Please give us more money so we can continue to expand our website and get even more users. And then one day, we'll turn on ads, and I'm sure all those millions of dollars will just start rolling in the next morning. See, the modern venture capital approach is that if you can build an audience as quickly as possible, as much as possible, especially when that audience isn't being served by existing offerings, say, stodgy old traditional media companies that are used to printing the news, you can capture those users' attention now and worry about how to make money off of them later. And because ad tech values specific users more than general users, it means that the most valuable thing you can do is capture very specific targeted types of users. That's why in advertising technology, as it stands today, it's all about targeting. It isn't about the right topic or the right aged people. It's about getting very specific people with very specific interests, with very specific income. Advertisers don't want a poor millennial who can't afford to buy what they're selling. And the thing is, Facebook has tracked that data and more for themselves, as have most social networks, because their users tell them that data. Um, and, not, and when their users don't tell them that data, they can look at what those users are posting, compare it to what other users are posting, and make assumptions based on what users who have told them that. Are saying. You have a question. They're bringing, they're bringing Facebook to the like button, which is basically monitoring what the particular Facebook user does online. So they have a lot more information than just what people post. Exactly. Now, just because um, they didn't open up their platform just to publishers, it's opened up to advertisers as well. And publishers are open up to advertisers. So now publishers find they have to compete on the basis of user data at the level collected by Facebook. But they have no means to collect that data. They're not following you all over the web for the most part. And they're definitely not asking you to post every day, to fill in all of the profile information, and to post that picture of the cool, expensive thing you bought that image recognition is definitely determining your income from. So Facebook has very specific targeting that is available to those advertisers because of that data. Now, this is a sort of brief example here, but essentially what's going on is the more specific my targeting is in creating a Facebook ad, this is the Facebook ad interface. If you have a Facebook account, you can use it. Um, the more specific my targeting is, the less people are likely to see my ad 
but the more people are likely to click through it, according to Facebook's measurement. The goal is to find the specific people who match your ad, because you will end up getting more clicks for your money. Essentially, Facebook is giving me a discount on the number of clicks on an ad I will get because I have made my targeting more specific. Because it's about getting a specific group, and because it's about targeting a particular audience, publishers followed the same, because that is what their ad tech required. And that means that there is very specific needs that publishers are chasing when they're going out there, building new websites, trying to appeal to you as readers. With growing spending power and still unformed loyalty to particular brands, there's no audience that advertisers seem to desire more than millennials. Which means that this group of millennials, if they arrive on your news organization website, they're going to bring in more ad money per person as an audience than those boring Gen Xers. Now, this presents a serious inequity problem that was not anticipated. It means ads and the world of advertising will always enforce its values of a particular audience to platforms and to advertising technology, and finally then to publishers, making media outlets ill-inclined to serve audiences that present less value. It means that advertisers, in a quest to target young dudes, because they believe that's the group for their product and the group <coughs> with spending power, even if that's just their assumption and not proven out, will bid to get, get that audience and get their ad in front of that audience. This will create a reinforcement cycle. Because they're bidding to get that particular audience, the value of that audience will be driven up, which means more people will look at the value of that audience and say, oh, those people are more valuable, so those are the people I should advertise against. Now, this has caused some seriously unfortunate after effects. This self-fulfilling prophecy has infested the entire marketing landscape. This is just an example of it in uh, the marketing of geek culture to women. Here we can see how this cycle works, where advertisers have made a decision that men are the only people who care about geek culture, so let's advertise mostly to them. And then because they're mostly devoting resources to them, that's where their success comes in. So they say, oh, well, since that's where the success is, that must be where I should invest more money. And so they continue to exclude women more and more from their marketing. And this cycle just continually reinforces itself. There's no check. And the problem is that when this happens, it redlines entire groups from receiving resources on the web. You might think of advertising as just advertising, but it can be a lot more serious than that, especially considering that Facebook presents particular posts to you based on this advertising data. The categorization and splitting of audience into these small portions has real-life consequences, as you can see in just these two examples. And there are many more out there. Now, money has poured into digital media in the last decade because, due to technology, internet advertising money is a function of eyeballs, which is to say, the more people you can get to stare at your page, the more your ads are worth, the more money you make, and eyeballs, and particularly millennial eyeballs, become a commodity, and one that could be sold by publishers through advertising technology. But anything that can be sold can also be purchased, and as advertiser requirements narrow into even more and more specific audiences, publishers found that they needed to acquire those audiences through more and different means. How did they do this? They engaged in a version of something called arbitrage. What that means is they were buying these audiences for a specific amount that they believed was less than the amount they would earn when that audience landed on the page. In this case, the most a, pub a publication can spend, according to this article in Digiday, is five cents to get a click on an ad on Facebook or on another platform. That means that one person's visit to a page, theoretically, is earning them somewhere in the realm of five to six cents, probably. But publishers aren't the only ones trying to find very specific audiences with very specific messages. Others, both politically and commercially motivated, are gaining that system. It turns out that being able to target very specific users with very specific messages makes it very easy to persuade them, especially in a space like Facebook, where their normal walls for distrusting ads, 
the ways they normally look at ads, are down. The ads themselves look like the content, so users don't think of them as ads and suddenly become much easier to persuade. Now, what this causes is something that I like to think of as a unvirtuous circle. So platforms like Facebook and Google will attempt to increase their relevance and value to advertisers and publishers by increasing the type of data about users that they target against. Then the advertisers and advertiser systems, seeing that data available on Google or Facebook, are going to make their inventory demands, that's the demand for the available ads that might be on a site, more specific in what users they are targeting. So instead of targeting a more general audience, they target this very specific audience. This means that they're not going to be taking up as much money in a publisher. If you can target a specific audience, you don't need as many impressions, as we saw, that's views of an ad, as we saw with that Facebook ad example. So this means they're leaving a lot more of the display ads that could be seen on the table from those publishers and platforms, not purchasing them. As a result, media organizations have to spend more to build and use systems that collect data on their users. This causes their cost to present ads to users to go up, and it means that they are taking large swaths of their advertising inventory and essentially devaluing it. An ad that might have been able to sell for two cents now is only worth one cent. And then platforms like Facebook and Google and the advertising technology systems that share a technological basis with them need to seek more information about users, need to find out about demographics, behavior, how they interact with ads. Forcing, this forces users to submit to even more tracking, more technology. The platforms then need even more data that they collect from interactions with publishers. So they ask publishers to implement new technology. A good example of this is the AMP platform. If you go and search for a news article on Google on your phone, you'll often see a little lightning bolt next to it. That means that if you click through, you are reaching a version of that article that is hosted by Google. Why do this? because it means that Google can have greater control over how this page is executed and greater control over what type of data is collected and how it's done. And publishers who lean on platforms like Google for traffic and ad tech companies for, mon for money, um, they have to agree to these terms. What this is, is a continual focus on defining users into smaller and smaller groups and then defining these web pages against those users' interests. This unvirtuous circle just keeps going in on itself. Every year, we have more data we need to collect to you about you to figure out how we're going to put the right ad in front of you. And every year that happens, we lose money. See, the problem is that as this system continues to go forward, we no longer have control over how uh, we, as publishers, people making the web, no longer have control over how these systems work, how we consider them to collect data ethically or at all. And because the technology to run these systems is being owned by third parties, Google, Facebook, and others, the amount of money that publishers earn from these platforms goes down. See, profits move away from publishers because these efficient advertising tools arrive to the platforms first, they have that data firsthand on those platforms, and then ad tech companies are demanding that publishers compete by collecting that same level of data, something which is simply impossible. But ad tech companies continue to try. This is the number of advertising technology products currently available today. It is almost 7,000 individual products an increase since, two, uh, since 2011 of something like 4,000%. Okay, all this revenue that once resided inside media organizations is flowing out to data and measurement focused tools. That's a lot of money in the wind. When, some, when an advertiser buys an ad on a publisher website, 
they only end up having 30% of the money they spent to place that ad actually going to the publisher. The rest is sucked up by an ever-increasing number of middlemen. Some have taken to noting this unvirtuous circle as a race to the bottom, because no matter how much page views rise for most publishers, profit will continue to go down, because the costs go up and the difficulty of targeting goes up. The irony is that trending on a platform like Facebook isn't even really driven by the advertising. This is what a trending story looked like on a tool called Signal, built by Facebook, now shuttered and no longer available, but at one point only available to journalists. It was used to be able to spot a trending story before it trended, so you could report on it. As you can see, this trending data is driven mostly by individuals, not pages, not purchased ads. The circle of focus on this user data is giving bad results. This article, in this case true, though many of these trends have ended up at false during the time that Signal was out, um, that was when there was a, a lot of fake news. Um, it doesn't matter because it's stripped of context. If you take a look at some of the user comments, they really don't have anything to do with the story. Um, the problem is that this circle of focus has nothing to do with how users understand the news, what they're interested in. It just has to do with the data that they generate as they pass through the internet. See, the more people who pay attention to this story, the more it's going to draw in. And what people have focused on and made go viral about this story isn't right. And it isn't right for what they are looking for as consumers of the news. And in long term, this unvirtuous circle will even have platforms suffer. This year, the number of users on Facebook went down. It turns out that putting people in smaller and smaller bubbles of interest isn't actually how people want to interact with the internet. See, there's a problem here. The combination of these highly targeted readers squeezed into smaller and smaller algorithmic bubbles and the advertisers targeting those smaller and smaller bubbles, it means that the content that is in those bubbles and available to those users is going to get very, very specific. And it won't only get specific in topic, it'll end up getting patterned around tactics that are successful, which means that suddenly every publisher ends up doing that one weird trick that will give you goosebumps when talking about it. Which is to say, how we talk about our content, how we talk about our journalism, and how we ask readers to engage with it, ends up all looking the same. Journalism that performs well ends up getting shared the same way as weird listicles, creepy conspiracy theories, and slideshows, regardless of what the content or its relevance is. A very good example of this is YouTube. And let's see if the sound works. Yeah, it doesn't matter what it is you're talking about or what you're doing on YouTube, suddenly everybody is getting really the same. And before you know it, the algorithms of this platform end up forcing people, the people who make the content for that platform, to act perform and distribute in very specific ways. Ways so inescapable that they end up keeping you up at night, just so you can work, do enough work to successfully match that pattern. Now, this is because YouTube requires a certain amount of content every day, a certain amount of content every week, a certain amount of content every month, and the day that you don't match yourself to that algorithm, suddenly your videos fall off the face of the earth as far as anyone who goes to the youtube.com front page knows. This doesn't have to do with what readers want. It just has to do with what this algorithm has seen in particular user behaviors. And it selects for those user behaviors and selects content for those users that conform to it. This is another example of a self-reinforcing system. Because the YouTube algorithmic system for recommending you content is attempting to get you to see as many ads as possible. It's based on the same values that the marketers have in that previous cycle we saw with geek culture marketing, right? It's continuing to focus in on the wrong assumptions because it continually reinforces them and rejects data that might disagree with it. This is not great, especially because when it comes to content that doesn't have to do with cooking 
or random YouTube parties or whatever that might be out there. When it comes to content that has to do with politics and the nature of our democracy, narrowing the view can have serious consequences. The more targeted you're publishing, the more successful it's going to be on social media, and therefore the more successful it was at generating ad revenue. The unintended consequences of this have come into stark view since the election in 2016. It turns out that the more partisan you can be, the more money you'll make. See, this is the problem when dealing with the analysis of a lot of these subjects. What you see has happened in news and social media over the last five years, this isn't just one problem. The cause is holistic. No matter how many tweets might be in your favorite game theory thread, what happened isn't just one thing. It's that unvirtuous cycle, eating itself. See, it isn't just the Russians. It isn't just Google. It isn't just user data tracking. It isn't just one particular site. And it isn't just one particular candidate. The problem is that a system that is being built for platforms and ad tech, and therefore adopted by publications, is a system in which we target users and use that targeting to create value. For some, that value might be political, in the case of some of the ads that we believe the Russia put on Facebook. But for a lot of players in this ecosystem, the value is just money. A good example of this was one of the fake news producers interviewed by NPR during the uh, aftermath of the election talked about how he didn't have any political affiliation. He wasn't attached to any one particular site. His network of sites that he built um, covered both sides of the aisle. And by doing so, he earned somewhere between 40 and 70K a year. Now, this is a job that he's doing and making money off of. And it's because a big piece of this problem is that journalism and the content involved just isn't in this equation. Most of these media orgs that are implementing the advertising technology are just one more vector in exacerbating a problem that's just cycling in on itself every year. See, the problem is that the advertising technology companies and these platforms, they'll continue to collect data about the users on the page, and they'll use it in this arms race to build better products, but they're looking to make their money as well as possible, which means they'll take those better products and use them to find cheaper ways to target the audience, which usually means less ethical operators. This is why there's been such a, a series of articles that have come out lately in which you've seen journalists talking about uh, major advertisers' ads, like a car company, showing up on sites that they want nothing to do with, sites that support Nazis, sites that support Infowars, and all sorts of other rather nasty operators, nasty news websites, news in quotes here. Right? The thing is, once you have collected the user data, you go and you use that to find the users wherever they are. But it's not just that. When you want that ad, you want the cheapest ad you can buy. So you're going to buy an ad that targets that user at the cheapest website you can buy it on. And that cheap website is likely to be very low quality. This is a big problem that we have to solve. And not just because of the politics, as the cycle continues, publishers are ever more likely to get extinguished from the mix. Like Uber's drivers are currently facing down robo robot cars, our advertising operations face down robot influencers, things that have people no longer connected to the equation, producing the perfectly targeted content for that perfectly targeted audience. See, without media organizations empowered to act as ethical overseers, and with ads unhinged from anything other than the theoretical user data, the opportunity for fraud and misuse will continue to grow. This system's a black box. An ad fraud, which is showing, buying, or transacting on digital display ads under false pretenses, is continuing to grow. 
It's a huge amount of fraud out there, and it's continuing to become larger and larger and larger. And the effects are such that we can't even really predict what it'll be. Their system is such an enormous black box that we may very well, by running unscrupulous ad tech, be empowering criminals. Not just Russians who might want to influence the election, but actual mobsters who are looking to use advertising technology to launder money. This is a thing that has been seen within the ad tech ecosystem, and it is a problem. And we are not dealing with it right now, or at least not as much as we should be. And the other reason we must deal with this as people who are interested in building a better web is at the end of the day, we're starting to have the choice of dealing with it taken away from us. User data is under a severe protection crackdown in Europe. We haven't seen the first lawsuit complete over someone who has collected data on a user against their will in Europe. But if it does, the stakes could be enormous. And not just for the advertiser who acted unscrupulously or the ad tech company that ad acted unscrupulously. The way that the GDPR law works in the EU is every single person involved in the chain of violating a user's consent to be tracked or refusal to be tracked could potentially be fined tens of thousands up to hundreds of thousands, potentially millions of dollars. Now, when Google, if Google gets fined under GDPR, they'll be able to pay this. But your local journalism organization will not. If they don't start enacting these types of user protections, they could find themselves put out of business by these fines. And this is only the first law to impact our consideration of how we handle user data. As I stated at the beginning, California is starting to launch its own law to be put into place by 2020 that will also enact severe repercussions on those who select data about users of a web page without their active consent. They must see that they are being prompted to have their data collected and agree to it. And if they don't, the consequences could be enormous. Now, this is one of those times where publishers are uniquely placed to take the lead because, like I said, Google can pay that fee, Facebook can pay that fee, but most publishers cannot. So they must correct now. These are a lot of problems that are coming out of the ecosystem that we have here. This ad tech, the unvirtuous circle, the constant focusing in on smaller and smaller groups. The stakes are higher than they've ever been before. So how do we break through these barriers? Well, there's a reason we went through all of the elements of search engine optimization at the beginning. See, open graph and SEO tags are important to implement, not just because they have you show up on search and social, but because it enables readers and whatever their preferred tools are to interact with the content that media organizations produce in a standard way. Now, it isn't just about having the right tags. We have to consider what goes in them as well. Um, a good example of not thinking about this stuff is putting dead bodies or sexual assault victims into social share cards that show up as the images on Facebook or Twitter. That is spectacularly inappropriate. Yet this keeps happening because publishers do it all the time because they do not consider what the ethics are of these metadata tags and how they interact with the web. And the thing about building out these standards and applying them is it creates an environment, it creates an opportunity for more competitors out there in the platform space to step in as well. Once you have standardized tags that all work the same way that anyone knows how to expect, you can take those standard tags and use them in the next thing that will compete with Google, or the next thing that will compete with Facebook, or your own app, or someone's personal RSS feed reader. Um, one way or another, this allows competition and it allows publishers to build out strong, structured websites, which can read not just to machines, but to readers in an organized and easy to determine way. Next thing to think about in media organizations is how to be massive. Now, we previously talked about how publishers have been rolling out their verticals, unbundling them into separate sites. But Facebook traffic in the last couple months has started to roll back. 
For the first time in years, Facebook traffic has now become less of a source for readers coming to news organizations than Google. Google is once again in the lead in referring users to news websites. Um, as a result, these topical websites that were rolled out to follow a regime around how Facebook decided the web should be organized have begun to been rolled back. But this isn't the right way to go. There is, these are legitimate sites. They can cross-link with their original site. They can provide value because specific users are interested in specific content in their own ways. Somebody who comes to read a story about fashion is going to be interested in a different presentation than someone who wants to read about politics. Someone who wants to learn how to cook a dish doesn't necessarily need the same exact website as someone who wants to find out what sports stats are up there. Rebundling these sites is a terrible idea, especially because it means that we cannot establish the type of crosslinks that don't just tell Google what the value of different sites are to each other, but can allow these sites to interact with each other in more dynamic ways as separate entities that can work together. Next, we need to consider our content's value not as how it interacts with social media, but as pieces of journalism. Now, as I mentioned at the top, HTML does not have a byline tag. There is no sway that the internet has universally decided to tell you that this piece of content is authored by this particular person or what that means. Now, just because the internet, engineers, Facebook, Google, might not have decided that, might have decided that wasn't important, doesn't mean that journalists or readers don't consider that to be important. Many readers, in fact, follow bylines, follow particular writers. Now, publishers have had no involvement in how advertising technology, open graph, search engine optimization was designed. There is no capacity for us to designate what things about a particular web page have value. But things are changing. There are new opportunities. And we can emphasize with how we design pages, how we measure readers interacting with these pages, and how we deploy various components onto those pages what a news organization website should look like for journalism. One that values what has journalistic value over what has social value, by which I mean social media sharing value. Imagine, for example, a nutritional style label for content. This is one example, but I'm talking much more detailed than this. Think about what goes into journalistic work. How many editors worked on a piece? How much time did they spend? Is there an illustration? How many illustrators were involved? How many photos were taken, even if they don't all appear on the page? One thing you might consider, did it get copy edited? Perhaps part of the reason why copy editors are being removed from news organizations in such radically high numbers is because the work that they put in is not made transparent to the reader, nor is it tied to the value of the work as it's represented throughout the engineering structure. Nor is it tied to the work value of the work, even as how ads approach it. No one has built an advertising system that increases its value for a well-edited piece. But maybe they should. After all, isn't that something that readers respect, come to, and come back to, and have an interest in? Metadata about these pages, beyond what has been provided to us for, by social media, could drive all sorts of new ways to design our web pages, to design structures on the internet. Article-based recommendations that consider what the geographic location of the article is could drive different types of recommendations than those based off of search engine keywords. That byline information, that editorial information, could drive linking around where there's a particular voice a particular editor, even. There are playlist systems out there that could, instead of finding their next video through the terms that a search engine has defined as important, could look at who has produced it. What is the length of the video? Are there offers around that video that the publisher can make to that user that could potentially make that publisher money? And also, the types of content that are referenced in the body of an article can be used to allow personalization tools to recommend other articles within the site that share a particular format, a particular type of being read, 
or even articles that exist on another per website that you can create some sort of deal with. This is another way that publishers can make money by prompting their users to go to other sites in exchange for money from those other sites. Now, there's all sorts of options here when we dig deeper into that metadata. And there's all sorts of ways we can structure the site when we let go of what a search engine has told us is important or what a social media site has told us is important and consider what data is important to our readers, to the people who have authored the work, to the people who consider this work uh, critically. All of this information can drive new ways to build the web. Now, there's one other thing that I want to dive deeper into as well, a sort of structure that can help us to build out these metadata structures, to build out these different ways of web building web pages um, to support this type of thinking. Schema.org is a collaboration between sites that run aggregation, search engines, social media sites, and even publishers. It builds on all the things we've already looked at, but it also adds significantly more. It's important not just because it handles an increasing number of objects, increasing descriptions, more ways that we can define relationships, but because it's a way of marking up the web that supports metadata about content, about authors, and about publications, and how they operate. One of the reasons that schema.org has increased in popularity as of late is because Google is draw using structures within the schema.org um, system to define whether or not an article has been fact-checked and by whom. This site, schema.org, is the home of a description of the format a data object can take and all of the ways that object and that page can be defined. Now, a schema is a general word. I have the definition here, a representation of a plan or theory in the form of an outline or model. In this case, it's modeling the data on the web page. This particular schema, there are many types, but this particular one is at schema.org and is called schema.org because it is intended to be the ultimate way to describe the contents of a web page. People can extend it, add things to it. There's a community around it, including many people from publishers who are looking to extend it. There's another reason schema.org is important to discuss as well, which is why I'm going to be talking more about it in a little bit. It's important as the potential driving structure for a new way to serve advertisements. DAI, or dynamic ad insertion, um, handles ads in a server-to-server -server basis. What that means is when you normally get an ad on a website, it occurs because the website loads, a whole bunch of data loads, a whole bunch of advertising technology loads, then it looks at you as a user, then it sends that information out to a whole system that will make bids on you as a user, and then it will display you an ad. That system direct to client is slow, leaks information about you to people who might, you might not want to get it, and has the potential to execute nasty code on your computer. There's been a rash of um, click jacks and link hijacks where you load into a page that is a legitimate publisher's page, and an ad on that page takes you to another page without you clicking on anything or doing anything. Now, it's very difficult to deal with in the front-end side, that direct-to-client, what loads when you load the page, because the page is already loaded. Publishers no longer have an involvement in how that ad gets served to you. They cannot penetrate that black box. They have a great difficulty monitoring and understanding what's going on. Uh, it would be very difficult without a bunch of information about you visiting the page for a publisher even to trace back why a single ad appeared on a site when you see it. Now, the DAI system, dynamic ad insertion, is server to server, which means that when you make a request for a page, the data in that request and the data about that page is sent to an advertising system that exists on the back end, the area of the page before the site loads. That means that we can take that information, decide which pieces of it we wish to send to advertisers and how we wish to send it to advertisers, and monitor the ads that come back in before they ever appear on their page. When we can see what the code of an ad is, we can make sure that no ad that will ever hijack your browser shows up on your page. So this is secure, it's better monitored, it's, it's more under publisher control. But 
In order to do this, we need to give advertisers information about that page that they want to put an ad on. And that metadata is best described and contained in schema.org objects that can be built on page, in content management systems, on the back end of these sites. Now, schema.org um, incorporates elements of search engine optimization, open graph, and hcard, and many, many more. The goal is to make it easy for machines and applications to understand what is going on on a particular page. There are three ways you can apply schema.org to a page, uh, microformats, markup, and JSON-LD. I'm not going to go into the microformats or the markup right now. They are a little bit more complicated and a little bit harder to read. We're going to look at the version of schema.org objects contained within a JSON-LD object. What that basically is, is it's a small chunk of code. It exists just like the search engine optimization up in the head area of your page, and it is all in one place and centralized. Uh, we're going to dive into this in a little bit, but I would highly recommend that you take a look at some publisher sites, especially larger ones, that have this data in their head, and you can sort of see some examples of what it looks like. Now, this is just a small example of schema.org content. This is from one of my blog posts, and it's describing a whole bunch of information about both the content and me as the author. The particular, now schema.org has a lot of different objects. Same thing like what we saw with Open Graph, where you could have a piece of music or a video, but there's even more than that. In this case, we're going to be diving into an object based on the creative work object. Now, this is going to get a little complicated, and I'm going to open up the audience tools so people can ask questions. Um, but please feel free to interrupt me if this gets a, a little out of control and you're not sure what I'm talking about. So the creative work object is an object that describes a particular page. Schema.org objects have something called inheritance, which means that the creative work object has a parent from which it takes some of the ways that it describes the page, and it has children which give it more specific ways to describe a page. We're going to be looking very specifically at the, um, the type that is relevant to news organizations. In this case, the article type, or the reportage news article type, or the blog post type. These types all share very similar properties. Now, the type property in a JSON object will tell us what this page is about. So when we set the type property to say article or blog post, we're saying that's what this page is. This page is an article. This page is a blog post. Um, when we set the headline, that's similar to SEO data for title. When we set the description, also similar to the SEO data for title, uh, for description rather. The image, similar to how Open Graph handles image. That is supposed to be an image that describes your page. But the nice thing here is you can add more than one image to this set of images, allowing users who share your content, depending on the system they share it on, to select which of a set of images they'd like to share. Um, and there's a date publish and date modify, just like Open Graph, like we saw before. And that allows systems to sort of determine relevance by seeing what the date this was published is relative to the date now. So the nice thing is it has a number of editorially significant items already built in on a very base level. Your article can have a publisher, an author, an editor, and can even indicate that it's part of a larger series. Each of these types of properties that exist on that article object themselves can contain data about the, art the objects they are linked to and uh, supply a link directly to that object. So your author object does not exist just on the article in which it's based. It exists on another page which contains even more information about it. And we'll get back to what that means in a little bit. The other important thing is that when dealing with that publisher object, schema.org can allow publications to make their policies as editorial organizations 
more transparent. This is a long list, and there are more than even this. But needless to say, this allows publications to tell you what their policies are, how they do fact-checking, what type of people are hired there. They can even link to a report about what the diversity of their employees are through this system. This gives you a lot of data to understand a publisher and to understand its relevance to you as a reader and your interests. Now, another important piece of this is that author object. What it does is it allows you to create an ownership connection as an author of a piece of content to all of the articles that you've authored that are out there on the web. Now, what I have on my blog, for example, is a canonical author page. We talked about the canonical value before, and what it is is it's telling the internet, this is the one location right, for that particular article under that particular URL. A canonical author page tells you this is the one location for this author. And from there, you can link out to all of the places you've published your work and all of the places that have worked with you and have information about you and connect them in a way independent of any single publisher, but relevant to you as an author. Now, you can do this on your own page. If you work for a media organization, that media organization could potentially put something together that gives value to your current work by showing your previous work at other organizations. And you can even build this page out independently. Now, if you have a website, this next exercise you can enact on your website. But for the sake of those who perhaps do not have a website or do not want to deal with building a website or even building a page on the website right now, I have a link up here to aramzs.me slash ID demo. This is going to take you to a template page on a service called Glitch, which will allow you to build out a web page that you can make live and share on the internet as soon as you're done with it. It'll contain a couple of the elements of JSON-LD right off, and it'll allow you to build on it. The second link on this slide is to a description of the major schema.org object. So you could take a look at it. Now, the demo page I've linked to is set up to be an author page. Um, but you can look at the schema.org site and decide that you're going to build a page that describes a particular piece of music or something along those lines. That's why I've provided the link here. So what I'd like people to do um, for about 15 to 20 minutes, maybe a little bit longer as people go out. Um, let's see about uh, building out a page for yourself, for you as an author. So I'm going to drag this up so we can take a look at what this looks like. What I'm going to do is actually have to open in a private window so I don't override the template. Please. Okay. And this is going to be a very simple template for a single web page. Uh, it's going to fetch this project. It's going to give it a funny name because that's what this particular service does. And that's going to give you some instructions on how to interact with the glitch service. Now, if you're not interested in going deeper into building a web page, you can ignore these for now. This is the code for your web page, for what could potentially be the web page that becomes the home page of your identity. Now, what I have here is the basic template of an author. You can fill these values in and have right off a basic author page. But there's a lot more that you can do. So what I'm going to do here is show you Oops the code for my author page here. You can see there's a whole bunch of information here describing what this page is, what it's on, information about myself, things that this might be part of, the licensing agreement that's in here. And as you build out your page, what you can do is go to the Google Structured Data Tool, 
And from there, you can enter the URL for your page. So I'm going to copy that page that I already have here. And test it in Google's tool for structured testing. On one side, it shows the HTML on the page. On the other side, it shows this object as Google understands it. Now, keep in mind, Google is one of the things that, that parses schema.org data, but it isn't the only thing. And while Google has very specific things it cares about, schema.org extends beyond that, beyond what even Google supports. And if you care about those values, then you should add them to your schema.org object. That's what I've done here. These two uh, errors are something I felt didn't need to be there or something I felt did need to be there, but they didn't support. So uh, what I'd like to do is give you some time to go through building out this page. Um, and as you go through it, just filling in that information, using that Google structured data tool, go ahead and ask me any questions about what you encounter. Take a look at the schema.org site and see if there's maybe something else that you want to add in there. Um, basically, you've got some time now um, to go ahead and take a look at everything and uh, ask me any questions that might come up. And I will be standing right here for a minute, and then I will walk around um, to see if anyone needs help. Uh, it's, if you just Google uh, Google structured data testing tool, and it's the first result. So it'll look like like this. Um, and if you're not interested in doing this and you're packing up, keep in mind there is another one of these sessions coming up. Um, next week we will be talking to a uh, VP of sales from Financial Times, the head of business development from Gizmodo uh, and their whole group of sites, Emily Bell from the Tao Center, and another person whose name I'm blanking on who is an expert on cybersecurity from the Tau Center. I apologize um, to them, but it will be on the event. Um, this is going to be a panel. I won't be talking if you've been to one of these, and especially if you've been to two of these, you've certainly heard enough of my voice. Um, I will be moderating, though, and we'll be talking about what's the future of display advertising on the web. This is a very interesting group of people to come and hear listen to. The link will be on the Twitter hashtag. It's in the event that you use to sign up for here. Um, this is a great group because Gizmodo Media Group uses affiliate links to make money, which means they don't use traditional display advertising at the same rate that other publishers do. So they have a very different way of looking at advertising on the web. The Financial Times, besides having one of the first walls that you acquire a subscription after a certain number of articles is also one of the very few publishers on the web that does not sell programmatic ads. Those are ads that come in based on bids and data and sucking up all your user data and all that stuff like that. Um, Emily Bell is an expert on journalism, digital journalism, and the ethics of digital journalism. And our cybersecurity researcher, who I am very sorry I'm blanking on her name right now, um, but she specializes in talking about and researching a system called real-time bidding, which is the process by which advertisers bid to put that ad in front of you based on the user data that is being collected about you. Um, please pay attention to the hashtag if you're looking for that link. And uh, there'll be a little wrap-up at the end, but don't feel that you have to say if you want to go and you're not interested in doing this exercise. Um, but yeah, I encourage you to check out the resources. I will be tweeting out links to all of these resources and to the recorded video of this session at the end of the evening. Um, thank you for coming. If you're leaving, uh, don't forget to cross out your name. If you're not, talk to me and I will help you with the stuff that you're working on. Yeah, no, please. Yeah, you can totally copy the uh, data from someone else. I'm going to show up. So, yeah. Um, what you can do here is 
if you would like to copy the information from my site, for example, um, where is it? Um, I may, no, it's right here. I just have to get it to show up. So you can look at it in two ways, right? You can inspect my page. And if you do, uh, this window will pop up. And when you inspect the page, you can go to the head tab. And in here, you'll see all of the optimization I've done for this particular page, a lot of the things we've already discussed. And when you scroll down enough, you will eventually see this tag here, script type equals application LD plus JSON. That indicates a JSON LD object. If you click down here, you'll see all of the information that I've put in. And what you can do is right click, or if you're on a Mac, two finger click on that item and say copy outer HTML, I think should do it. Let's see if that gets the right thing. Yes, copy outer HTML. Um, and that will give you all of my data and you can copy it, use it for yourself. This entire website that I'm using as an example, that's my website, is actually under a Creative Commons license. So you can use as many parts of it as you like as long as you uh, link back to the original site. So yeah, does that answer your question? Cool. Do you have a question? No? Yes. Uh, which, sorry, sorry. It's just a, not about the economy. Oh, yeah, sure. For general questions. Sure, general questions. Yeah. Uh, like you said, uh, the time when you focus on especially users, is there any specific model is not that close to the world later? I mean, I think that user targeting is going to be things that is become very avoidable in the modern ad world. I think it's just going to change fundamentally with requiring users to consent. Um, I think that what's probably going to happen is where you go onto a site in Europe that is GDPR compliant, you give it a list of a lot of things that you have to comply to tracking to. That's not going to last. It's too many things. It's too confusing. I think there'll be flows where you're asking people to actively exchange their user data for something of value, um, if that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, of course, I might be wrong. Who knows? <coughs> no question. Yes. I can't get it to work. Okay, let's see which is the issue. We also have a this kind of Okay, so if we hit play on the bottom here, hmm. Pages, secure settings, block the loading of the resource itself. Mm -hmm. I think this is a file, this is Firefox, right? And I think Firefox's security policy has blocked how Google is executing this. So I think you have to try it with Chrome. If there are any questions from the audience,
So as you're playing maybe with the glitch template, I like to note that glitch is a cool tool to try out stuff on the web. Um, both the SEO simulator you played today and if you were in the last workshop, the 90s newspaper business simulator were built using Glitch. It's a nice open source tool. I highly recommend it. Um, they're not paying me or anything. Yes? I have a question more generally about the ecosystem here. Mm -hmm. Setting aside the, um, the unvirtuous cycle, has advertising worked? Like, has Ford Motor Company, you know, whoever's using online advertising, has it worked for them? So, is that yeah, is it or is it not the case that they've gotten return on investment? Yeah, so that's an actually a really interesting question, which is proving very hard for a lot of these publishers, for a lot of publishers and for a lot of advertisers to answer. Um, there's a big move towards this model called last click attribution, which is the idea that if you see an ad and then one day down the line you click on something on that advertiser's site. It's going to try and attribute that click to whoever last showed you that ad, giving that publisher or whatever it is platform credit for it. This sometimes works. Um, the truth of the matter is a lot of people are blocking it. The web's a weird place. And even that's not necessarily a guarantee. Just because you were presented a Ford ad on Slate doesn't mean that that was the Ford ad that made me go to Ford.com. Maybe it was the one you saw a day, a day earlier on the New York Times. Um, a number of advertisers have really challenged the programmatic ecosystem. A really good example of this is uh, Procter & Gamble and Unilever, um, both of which have withdrawn a lot of their activity from the programmatic ecosystem. Um, I believe it was Procter & Gamble. One of, the, one of these advertisers basically took, um, I think it was like something like nine million, a lot of money yeah, yeah. out of the programmatic yeah. ecosystem and saw basically no change in their sales, yeah. um, which is a strong indication that the programmatic ecosystem probably does not work. Um, of course, there's all of these more interesting situations, right? Arguably, these ads purchased by Russians to influence the election might have had some sort of there's certainly a lot of statistical proof that would lead towards that. But like their goals are not the same necessarily as an advertiser goal. Um, trying to invoke an emotion is something that's very easy to do on social media. Trying to get someone to like a brand, ironically, is something much harder to do on social media. Um, there's a big push towards things called the influencer market space which is basically you pay people with a lot of Instagram followers to promote your product, but it's becoming more transparent. It's a lot harder to find who is a legitimate influencer, and um, your results may vary depending on what you're selling and what, you, uh, and what type of influencer you're working with. Uh, if you want to have a fun time, you can Google Listerine influencer, um, there was a big controversy around this a couple weeks ago, where this woman was basically like a lifestyle Instagram blogger, and then did a bunch of sponsored posts from Listerine, where it was like really set up scenes that happened to have Listerine in the corner, totally out of place. Um, now, maybe this worked as an influencer, maybe it worked as a shock campaign. I mean, it sounds like it worked just for novelty. Right, on novelty. But these things, novelty only works so many times, right? Um, one of the big challenges we've seen as publishers dealing with display advertisements is there's a constant rush, not just towards this user targeting, but towards whatever the next new thing is. The ad products a publisher might sell one year will not be as effective the following year. Users get used to it, they get blind to it, and then they're no longer effective. So there's constantly this reinvention of ad products. And one of the downsides of the programmatic marketplace is it does not adapt to new ad products very quickly, whereas direct sales, which is where I, a publisher with a salesperson, go to you for the brand and sell you an ad, those can adapt to new ad types a lot faster. Um, I think the question of whether or not the programmatic marketplace works is very complicated. And I think because of the way user targeting works, 
there's a certain irony in that direct sales continues to work better for a large company like Unilever or P&G. But if you're a small to medium company, finding those users is a lot more important to you, actually. Like, there was a great uh, thing where it's like, um, oh, what's the board game company? Uh, Hasbro released like some throwback version of Monopoly where you cheat. Um, so it's a version of Monopoly designed for you to cheat at Monopoly. And like they got a lot of attention on that and a lot of sales and it had nothing to do with them necessarily buying programmatic ads, right? It's about what they're selling and how they're selling it and how they presented it and where they presented it. Um, but that's because they have a lot of power already. They're large and they have a big voice. Your mom and pop shop uh, around the corner, you know, if they can get through all of the fraudulent ads that are in the marketplace, will probably have a lot better success in a targeted ad that's specific about targeting you because you are literally around the corner. Um, whether or not you want that is another question. Yeah. So there are a few companies that um, have tried to crack down on, on ad fraud. Uh, one example is White House. Uh, have, uh, have those basically using this type of uh, ad fraud detection prevention systems noticed improvement in, in your programmatic performance? I mean, for individual publishers or advertisers who can pay for someone like White Ops, which is a great company, I'm not down on them, but they are expensive to use, um, they can see some individual performance, but the overall programmatic marketplace, um, the fraud has only continued to increase. Uh, by some estimates, as much as 90% of the programmatic marketplace is fraud. Um, the most recent study of mobile ads found that only 43% of mobile ads that were shown were ever saw, seen by a human. There are incidents like MethBot, which are easy to spot after the fact by something like, I mean, they're not easy, but can be spotted after the fact. But often by the time they're spotted, millions of dollars in damage is already done. Um, by the same thing, the reason that publishers have been struggling so much with these click jacking situations where you load onto their site and an ad takes you away to some other site that tries to give you an Amazon gift card, right, is because that's like a rotating attack using inherent vulnerabilities that are unavoidable on the page. Um, there are companies out there that are trying to block this through blacklisting particular URLs or finding particular code and blocking it up. But the problem is because of how advertising technology is so interested in tracking user data about you and crawling out of that little ad block on the page and getting onto your computer and finding out information about what you're doing, right? To block that behavior would be to block the things that makes money for publishers. If you try and block the type of behavior that allows that to happen, you end up blocking all of the ways that user tracking works. Um, and if you're a publisher, um, especially one of size, that ends up taking a lot of your revenue away. Um, so. The irony is the larger the publisher, the more vulnerable they are to that attack because the harder it is to block. And you could build out tools to block it, but because those vulnerabilities are inherent to HTML and the browser, someone will change their attack vector and for 15 minutes or an hour or a day, they'll be click jacking a bunch of people off of your site. I'm sorry, you had a question? Yes, it's a question, comment. Um, I mean, I guess now that Google is saying it's going to Yeah, I mean, Google, like the ad tech ecosystem, is mostly a black box. So the answer is we don't really know. Um, but I'll have the link to the previous presentation up at the end of this one. And in the previous presentation, I actually have links to a number of Google sites that allow you to see all of the data that they have attached to your user account and potentially remove it. Um, this doesn't solve fully the problem. There's a phenomenon called shadow profiles, which is 
these companies, especially through the example of the like button, for example, um, build information about you as you travel the web and interact with their software that isn't attached to your user account and that they will retain. Um, this is one of the things that GDPR, for example, um, intends to solve. So do you have another question? So, so regarding schema, uh, like I, I think any type of, of an act if we're familiar with um, information and it can also be applied to schema. Like for example, like you know, imagine people putting your name on their fake articles and you having to you know monitor that the same way that you're monitoring comments. Um, I, I don't like um, what does it solve? Like, you know, it, it seems to me like we're putting a lot of effort to make the job for machines easier. Mm. Well, I mean, I think that, you know, fraud is a problem, but the more unique identifying points that are out there, the easier it is to find. It's much easier to find someone who is using your fake schema, your schema.org object inappropriately than it is to find someone who's using your byline in a mess of HTML inappropriately. But more than just the machines crawling it, that's why I mentioned uh, dynamic ad insertion. Um, because regardless of the schema's presentation on the front end, it has to be built into your content management system, the tool you use to build web pages on the back end. Um, and when it does, it provides data to that entire system that was not previously being used. Data that we can use to make different types of recommendations, data that we can use to build out new ways to connect pages together, and data that we can use to serve ads in this new and more secure way. Um, and so that's a big reason why it's important. I think another big reason is that um, it allows editorial organizations to talk about why they're editorial organizations and what that means in a way that machines can read and value. Um, now, this is sort of one of those weird middle points, right? Like how much do we have to deform ourselves to the will of something like Facebook or Google? But I think the issue is that it's not necessarily about Facebook or Google crawling these things. It's about us being able to say what our site is about. When you picked up a newspaper, finding the masthead was an easy thing. But finding the masthead on a digital news site is usually a lot harder. Now, having tools that make it easier is hard to build because nobody handles this in a standard way. But schema.org allows us to handle the placement of the masthead in a standard way that people can build tools to use. Now that could be like a bookmarklet or an extension, or it could be Facebook and Google determining how to value you. Um, and I think that the important thing is that we're building these structures out along what we value and not what something like Google or Facebook values, if that makes sense. I mean, the problem of fraud is inescapable, but um, the more ways we can sort of make ourselves easier to find against that fraud, the more ways we can differentiate through work and through linked objects against that fraud, and the more ways that we can build out this type of metadata that can exist in our systems before we ever render a page, the more opportunity we're going to have to execute ads ethically and effectively um, and potentially safely. I mean, you, 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 you know, your, your whole presentation is such an epic takedown of the advertising <laughs> model. Like, you know, why, why not actually, uh, you know, rather than sort of like try to develop a better ad model, why not try to basically think of how to, how to simplify the creation of, of, you know, the subscription in contrast to basically uh, committing an arm and a leg uh, if you want to cancel your subscription the way it is right now. Um, you know, for example, like micro subscription technology has been around for a couple of years, yet I've been, I've been struggling to find interest <laughs> among media companies because, because they're, you know, they're wedded to, to the advertising model. You know, well, so, so basically, yeah. you know, having you take down the advertising model of <laughs> the media kind of perhaps opens a segue to introducing a different business model. You know, it, yeah. Well, I think more people should chase subscription as well, but I think not every audience is necessarily ready to subscribe to every like for a particular site. Not every site is ready to be a subscription site. Um, and more than that, I think that the paywall model has challenges for us as journalists 
as well. Um, I mean, obviously, there's the idea that you give a certain amount free. But the flip side of that is there have always been free newspapers that were advertiser-supported. I went into this a little bit in the previous presentation. Um, I don't want to go too deeply into it here. But I do think that when you look at the model of papers, newspapers, printed ones, and their advertising, they show a model of ads that has worth to readers. Right? If you're a local newspaper and you're selling local ads, those local ads theoretically have value to your readers in a way similar but different to how the journalism does. Um, if executed effectively, advertising can be symbiotic instead of parasitic. Um, now, I think more people should chase subscriptions. Um, there's a lot more potential in that. And we've seen that easy-to-use systems have um, built up a lot of publisher revenue. Um, obviously, the Washington Post, the numbers are out there, has been very successful with subscriptions. The New York Times, their total subscription sites like The Information, which had very particular audiences and needs, and they have been very successful, as has the Wall Street Journal. Um, I hope you come next week because the Financial Times is the first publication to launch a paywall, and it has been enormously successful for them. Um, but, you know, the downside of the paywall is that it does require an investment and you need to be able to present to your readers what that investment means and what it's for. There's, you know, a lot of variance on this model in a lot of space. I think paywalls are good and important. Um, I think advertising is a way for new entries to come in, uh, in one of the ways, not the only way. And I think it does have potential benefit if executed properly. Um, I think also there's other models out there as well. I, I mean, Paywall is such a, such a terrible brand. I mean, I, I, I'm interested in, you know, in a um, vented road or red carpet, but not, not in a Paywall. Um, well, I, I think there is opportunity for innovation in that space. Um, I, will, I, I think there is. There's definitely opportunity for innovation. I will tell you that um, journalists like even less the idea of a velvet rope or a red carpet to their journalism, for the most part. If I could add to that. Yeah. The thing where I did hear you mention, uh, and I'm very, I'm very bullish on constant paywalls too. But um, if all the you know real journalists, and I, I use that on iron, if all the real journalism goes uh, behind a paywall or the rope or whatever, the question is raised: uh, Where do the people who cannot afford nine ninety nine a month or twenty five cents an article and whatever the model is, where do they get their news from? Yeah, I think that's a serious problem. Maybe, maybe if there's a way to get libraries to have paywall access. I mean, there's opportunity there. I think there's another model as well in terms of funding individual journalists. Um, there's been some very significant success stories on Patreon, for example. Um, that's also something that really because it's a system Right, it is, it is a system optimized for individuals. But at the same time, when you build your audience engagement correctly, I think it doesn't have to necessarily be around individuals. There are groups that work on Patreon, and there are even some individuals who have very successful Patreons and use those to fund larger organizations. Um, there's a lot of difficulty there. Obviously, we have not finished figuring out how to make money for journalism yet. Um, but I think that uh, the advertising system will never go away. Um, there will always be advertiser-supported journalism. There has been for a long time, and I think there will be forever, uh, pretty much, until the world burns or we stop using money. Um, like, it, advertisement will always have a place, and part of it will be in supporting journalism. Um, and I think we can't turn a blind eye to that, because turning a blind eye to how we monetize using ads and journalism is what got us in this situation in the first place. Um, I didn't go as deeply into it in this presentation as the last one, but a fundamental problem we've had is that this has come out of nobody on the publisher side planning for how ad tech should work, how advertising on the web should work. And because we didn't plan for it and we didn't voice up in this process until very recently, um, we're stuck in a really bad situation. So I think, you know, we need people who are innovating on how to do a better paywall. But we need people who are innovating on how to do better ads. I mean, part of the point of this workshop is I hope that some of the folks here may leave with ideas for how to build better advertising systems. Um, that is what I do. Uh, so obviously, I have a stake and a bias in this as well. 
Um, but yeah, I wouldn't, I didn't come into this from the business side. I came into it from a journalism side. And my belief is that paywalls are part of the equation, but we need to have advertising work too. Hold some more questions. I'm going to finish this up here. Um, let's close that up. So speaking of things to take away from this, um, this is our takeaway slide. What we, we've learned tonight, hopefully, is um, search engine optimization, how page rank works, how Google understands our pages, how Facebook understands our pages. Um, we've learned about how tech companies are using the data from these structures, from these constructions of pages, to target users in smaller and smaller segments, eventually to their own uh, disaster, essentially. And we've talked about building these data structures of the web um, into forms that are based in to journalistic values and editorial values. We need to redefine what worth means on the web in order to fix this problem. Um, I've already done my promotion for next session, but this is the link to it, Bad Tech 3. Um, I highly encourage you to go. This is a great panel. Um, I'll repeat it again. Great panel, good group of folks. Um, I could not think of a better group to discuss alternatives to how display advertising is working now while still discussing the inevitable existence of display advertising into the future, um, that being ads you see on the page. The hashtag is still um, active. It's broken ad tech on Twitter. Um, I will put up the latest. Um, I, my account's been tweeting out links to the stuff we've been doing as we've been doing it. Um, sometime later tonight or early tomorrow morning, I will tweet out a link that has all of the resources we have here. Um, this is being streamed. That will be linked as well. Um, also, this presentation will be linked. My presenter notes are um, usually very large, occasionally misspelled, and often filled with links. Um, so if you are interested in following up on any of the topics in the slides that we covered, um, all of the slides that have quotes or links to very or pictures of various articles have links to those articles. I highly encourage further reading. Um, and uh, you know, if there was a misspelling, it's autocorrect. I swear. Um, that is it for tonight. Thank you very much for coming. Please come to our panel. It's a great group tomorrow um, next week. And I'll be here for a little bit while longer if you have any questions. Last time I was here, I had to run to a train, but uh, thankfully this time I do not. Uh